We're on our way to Alaska. Hello, Joy. Are we ready to go? I'm ready. I'm ready. Eddie, are you ready? We're there, ain't we? <laughs> and there's Bill? Pretty soon, pretty Are we soon. having fun yet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Mueller, are we having fun yet? I haven't had my coffee yet. <laughs> okay, we're getting ready to board the plane to Vancouver. We will be leaving shortly. Getting ready to board the Horizon flight on our way to Vancouver to start our cruise. CBS News. Mostly <laughs> BS. Where's EP? Here comes the late Eddie P. We're boarding the ship. Ship ahoy. <laughs> Whoa. There's Joy. <laughs> I have myself from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Well, yeah, I got some pants and I'm right on. Okay, I'm about 12 hours drive that way. My so my question for you today is where will I be DJing every night this cruise at about 11.15 in the evening? Hey, we're cruising. We're leaving Vancouver Port. Want to say anything, Paul? No. Wave goodbye. <laughs> what? Five years of planning. Joy is exercising while she's on vacation. Say hi, Joy. <laughs> Too much work, Joy. They're carving an ice sculpture in the kitchen. Okay, now I'm on. Sure glad we're all here. <laughs> we're on the U.S. Rhine Dam. 
right out uh, gonna be in Ketchikan tomorrow in Alaska beautiful yeah baby <laughs> Good night, Irene. Night, Irene. Press the button again. Press the button again. We're in Ketchikan, Alaska. We just arrived and we docked off the boat. Say hi, Joy. Hi, Joy. <laughs> We're following you guys. There's our ship docked at the pier.
These are bald eagles at the, where are we, Joy Heritage Center? It's going to wait and see if anyone else walks in the next couple of days. Hey, we're just drying off. We're fighting our time to get the rain on the next day. Kind of like your uh, human race. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, they have eight times the eyesight that we have. Uh, they have no peripheral vision. Uh, they compensate with that by... Uh, being able to turn their head 180 degrees. They also have polarized vision, and what that does for them is it makes it to where they can see into the water. Uh, they see no reflection on top of the water, and when you take a picture, the flash will just reflect right out of their eyes. Um, another thing that it does for them is it gives them superb depth perception in the water. You know how when we drop a point in the water and we go to reach for it, it's really not right there. You kind of got to go to the left or to the right. They don't have that. They see exactly where things are, as if there was no water there. Um, about the steelhead trout. As you can figure, I found out about three days ago that these are not steelhead trout. And these are rainbow trout. I don't know anything about that species. Um, I know that they lived for about uh, two or three years. That's about it. But if you guys want to do me a big favor and pretend that these are steelhead trout, I can tell you all about those. Would you guys do that for me? Okay, we're at the Totem Heritage Center in Ketchikan. Big, huge totem pole. Ed and Joy are going to go on a little tour of some park. Ketchikan, Alaska. There's a plane that just landed, a little float plane. watching for Ed and Joy, but I don't see him yet. They have an hour before we have to get back on the ship, so hope they're having a wonderful time. Here come Ed and Joy back. Ah, oh, no, I can't see him. Joy! Joy! Up here! Hey! Is Ed and Joy.
red things? It's on. It's on. It's Here blinking. It's on. 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 Joy and Ed are walking towards the Mendenhall Glacier. Water reach. Say hi. Why is this something else? It's like Minnesota. Minnesota in the springtime. Yeah, right. Shirley and Bill are up there in one of those helicopters, I bet. Like three or four of them up there.
What's that game? Are you complaining? Well, no, no. Where are all? Yeah, where? Oh, where are all? Oh, did you guys have the dragon? Oh, no, no, no. It's coming at all. Okay. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, got him? We're ready? Oh, no. 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 Oh,
vicious about this. No, you got a fish. I'm pretty light about it, actually. <laughs> You said you don't have to be vicious about it. Just make sure you keep that hip up. You're babbling this thing. You deserve it in the boat. That thing probably started off with five pounds. It's going to come in and lost five pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Better always 25 pounds. Joey, we need to have exercise this morning. Oh, look at that. Oh, shit, it's 10 feet long. Are you grabbing this guy? Right like this. Right like that. Yeah. Get her up. Are we brushing the teeth? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's a 16. Hi, honey. Do you want to go tuck her down? Oh. Yeah. I'm going to tuck her down. Do I hold the end of the scale? I mean, it's all by itself. Getting here. I think you finally wore it out. Thank you. 
Well, usually we have tuition really more and everything is about 11,000. So tuition alone is only about 4,000. So he comes out pretty good. Yeah, he's got another fish on. Greg? Yeah, I hope it You just lost the sound, Rigger. What? Oh, there it is. <laughs> we had no, the old man we had no power to it there for a minute. Losing a downrigger means over the side, Jeff. No, it doesn't. It means not working. It means broken, defective. I see it, Jeff. 30, 45 seconds. My heart's in the deep here. Now you're going to keep this one in. Why? 
Well, because so it's the lowest. We will be able to, would have been able to afford that helicopter ride. <laughs> Who made Billy pay for it? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Billy. I'm the one making the money here. <laughs> this is excellent. This is excellent. You were supposed to let Judy or me do it. What? That's all right. You want to reel it in? No, no. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> here, I'll hook a line on his pants right here, throw yeah. him over the side, and <laughs> reel him in. I might let it go. <laughs> <laughs> That might be a willing in. release, huh? <laughs> Kitchen release. Sorry, can't keep him undersized. <laughs> Come on over this way, yeah. Great. Turn in towards short. Oh, there he is. He's going over that way. Thanks. Ooh, he's got a cold hand. Oh, my pillow. Put my shirt out of the garbage can, too, would you? <laughs> I'll pick up the pillow, but it'll just leave my shirt in there. See a little tail. Turn some more. Is that on your pump? You got double? That's all right, that's all right. In the boat. There you go. Oh, there you go. Oh, great. You got nine in the boat. Well, you got to give me one more just for good luck. How about that? Oh. It's called cruelty to animals. <laughs> you didn't complain when you had it on your...
There's a lot. They have, there's like the, those ovals. See how they have the, yeah. there's, there's like so many, only so many, so many symbols in the, but in the language. The gal with the poodle that, skirt explained it all. She explained them and see how there's, see up there, there's the U yeah. and then there's the, the line inside the U and then, and these are the basic shapes. Like when you, we went ship on the ship fishing the other day, this kid had these blue jean pants on. Oh yeah, they had, had the paintings and stuff on them. He had the paintings on them and they were the totem markings. So you'll see that. You'll, oh, really? Once you start noticing them, you can see that's what everything is based on. Oh, I was wondering what the hell what kind of pants those were. <laughs> New but style. it was all the markings of the, the yeah. totem. But I don't remember, or I don't know what each of them meant, but it was real interesting. Hi, Paul. Kind of nippling. <laughs> Always is nice. Feels like springtime in Minnesota. Oh, I think my battery's going dead. <laughs> springtime in Minnesota, huh? I don't wear much more than this in the winter. Hubbard Glacier. It's wonderful. <laughs> Joy, are you cold? Joy, are you cold? Well, not bad, but not too bad. It's probably one of those icebergs that we
say something. Say something, Paul. Yakutat Bay, along through the glacier calving area, whatever. This is all floating debris. It's bigger and thicker about a mile ago. Almost have to be here. Yeah. yeah. I can zoom it in, see. And get something up close. And zoom it out to get more of a wide angle. It's a pee pee bird. probably the most famed dessert on the high seas. At this time, I'd like to ask you to kindly join me by putting your hands together and welcome direct from the galley, the Baked Alaska Parade. to do or see here. Someone's kayaking.
Hi, Joy. Hi, to me. <laughs> Big town of Albies, Alaska. Yep. It's really windy. I can't. Those uh, ends towards the uh, shore are the ablation zones or wastage zones. Up higher in the glacier, it's a bit thicker. And again, they have their own big little ice fields that uh, the ice is accumulating travels downhill then, called a CIRQE, C-I-R-Q-U-E, CIRQUE Basin. It's cold out here. <laughs> Where the little second uh, airplane is down there on the left hand side, there's two little red and white airplanes right about where that second one is, he'll leave the ground. Very short field, maybe 200 feet is all he needs to take off and land. So be ready for it, it will happen rather quickly. Here he goes, he's rotating into the port airport now, and here he is, throttle of the firewall, tail off the ground, he needs about 40 miles an hour airspeed. And there he's about got it, and rotate and lift off. Now he's going to fly around and come back and land right next to us here. So you'll get a shot of these little float planes here in the background, and we'll have the uh, picture lined up for you. We're going to be in the grandstand for a few more moments while we move down and get into position for the landing. As I mentioned, these little airplanes are a lifeline to rural Alaska, and perhaps nobody has a better example of how important they are than the pilot right there himself. See, Bill Johnson lives over here in this runway. It's a quick hop for him to get into his airplane and run errands for folks, and he got a phone call one morning from one of our villages just outside of Fairbanks. They wanted to fly out and pick up this. You see the little float planes right there. Now you're going to get a neat shot. You've got the float planes in the foreground. You'll have the little Piper Super Cub coming in. He'll leave the little, little uh, lawn decorations and all the ornaments and the park bench and the canoe right where they are and just come right in over the water's edge. Now he's over water now. Flaps are down. He's got the power back. He's probably doing about 38 miles an hour. Now he's over ground. He can drop down a little bit more. Put the wheels on the ground. Slide to a stop right here at the bow of Discovery 3. Out of 200 foot landing strip right there. Bill Jones, point pilot. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Sharp left off the bow. Three feet off the shore, perhaps. It looks like he's towing a, a little tree, but you can see his head there. He's got that in his mouth. The beaver are the largest rodent in North America. Scientific name, Castor canadensis. They are champion and our neighbor Susan Butcher. Good morning Susan. Good morning. Boy this looks like way more Here, fun than most people picture. have this time in the morning. What's going on at Trail Breaker Kennels? Well we are. We're having a very exciting morning. Um, first we're out here Zoom with down. young and old. Um, on the top. There are puppies here. They're nine weeks old right now. And the great dog walked by the pen back there. She's one of the oldest members of the kennel. She's one of our retired dogs. She's 14 years old. Jesse and she ran uh, in the Idea Run with me in my winning team in 1990 as one of my main leaders. And all the dogs that we raise here at the kennel and that race with us, retire with us, they're really important. Not just as old friends who, of course, help us keep the town form, but very importantly, they're the ones who help us train these younger dogs. And actually, we had a very exciting night last night. One of my females, Puslia, had a new litter of puppies, so these guys are not even small.
blow across their noses and they start to get a sense of us right well, she's the getting her hand. And this bonding, of yep. course, continues throughout their whole life. Now I'm going to send this one back to their anxious mom. Um, what we like to do with the puppies at this stage, at this nine-week-old stage, is take them on daily walks in the woods. And we always take the older dogs with them because what we're trying to teach them is the same love of adventure that we have. And also, the beginnings of a trust and be trusted relationship. And that's pretty easy to do because there are so many obstacles out there on the trail. There's some, uh, there's some water to swim through, some steep cliffs to go up, and some big logs to climb over. And we're there to encourage the puppies over them, praise them on the other side. But most importantly, if it's too much for them, then we're there to lift them over it. And this way, they can start to understand that we'll be there for them at every stage of their life. And that is most important when they start running in harness and racing, that they can understand that we'll never ask them to go any farther or faster than they're capable of. And you know, watching all these youngsters over here, kind of this toddler stage, are you watching them for any leadership uh, capabilities or anything like that at the early stage? Well, I'm always looking for um, a next great leader. And these guys actually are such a consistent Although I do have a favorite in here, but we've learned that it just takes years of patience and bringing each puppy around to their full potential before we can figure out which ones are going to be the great sled dogs. And I can probably best describe that to you in the story of a dog that was born in the kennel over 20 years ago. When he was a young pup, he didn't look like he was going to be a very good sled dog. He had poor hair coat, coat not knees and no confidence at all. And most mushers would have given up on him and sold him as a pet. But it was a challenge that I couldn't resist to try and make him into a champion sled dog. So I worked very hard to physically bring him around through special nutrition and training. Mostly, I concentrated on his lack of confidence. And I gave him a strong name, Granite. And he soon learned to draw from my strength and confidence. And we became a very powerful team. And all that extra work paid off because Granite eventually led me to victory the 1986 and 87 Iditarods, both of those in record time, along with countless other races between three and 500 miles in length. But his story goes on from there because while we were training for the 1988 racing season, he became very seriously ill. And I had to rush him down to Anchorage to a veterinary hospital to try and save his life. We set up a cot next to his kennel so that I could sleep with him there day and night, petting him and willing him to live. And finally, after two weeks, the veterinarians told me that I could take him home but that he was never going to be able to run again. He had permanent damage to his heart and liver and kidneys. So I took him back to our homestead in Eureka, and he was living in the cabin with David and I. But every time we'd take the other dogs out on runs, he would cry and howl, wishing that he could go out with us. And what the veterinarians didn't understand is that Granite had grown to be a magnificent canine athlete who loved to run and race. And all the dogs love competition, and they understand when they have won. They have as much pride as any human athlete. Granite was determined to get back on the team. And slowly but surely, his test results started showing improvements that the veterinarians were astounded at. And they decided to let him start training with the little puppies on two mile runs. And he soon advanced to running with the yearlings on 10 mile runs. And finally, by January, he was once again running with the main team. And the veterinarians okayed him for a 200 mile race. And he chose that young team to a record setting victory. Then one and a half months later, he went on to do the impossible. He led me to victory in the Iditarod. And he did it by pulling me through the, a blinding snowstorm and stopped all of my competitors. So we finished 14 hours in front of the second place pressure, couldn't make it through the storm. And that made Granite the only lead dog to ever win three consecutive Iditarods. <laughs> Granite passed away, uh, what, almost three years ago now, but I'm looking around the kennel, and I was over here the other day, and I noticed uh, a lot of the old familiar bloodlines. He's still here in a way, isn't he? Well, we definitely have a lot. We have a few of his sons and daughters still, a lot of grandchildren and great-grandchildren, so we're very lucky to have a spirit still in the kennel. Well, you get these youngsters uh, put away, I see, and here comes some of the older dogs. You get them in the harness at uh, an early stage, right? Well, right. What we like to do after the young stage that you saw is about five months of age, we put them in harness. Now, these guys have all been in harness. The oldest ones are uh, 12 months old, and the youngest are seven months old here. That's a very exciting day for us, their first time in harness. We take one adult leader out in front and four to six puppies behind. And it's so instinctive in them to pull that within just a minute or two, they start to look like a small adult team of 
dogs. So we actually have a saying here at the kennel that it only takes us two minutes to teach them to go, but about two years to teach them to walk. <laughs> kind of like a teenager with a driver's license. Susan, what are some of the things you do for exercise for these dogs in the summer? Well, on a nice cool day like this, this is going to be wonderful. We've got um, a four-wheel cart that we can use on our winter trails that they can uh, pull and, and do some mushing, and that's a good time for us because we're working with many of these young dogs trying to make them into young leaders. And uh, on the hotter days, though, we have to think of other things. We like to take them swimming. They like to go back here in the lake. So we've got this modified horse walker, and each dog can take a station here and they love to just pull this round and round and then if one of them decides that they've had enough of the pulling well they can just jump on board and take a little ride <laughs> tori is a good one for that but uh, now speaking of going for a ride we're going to see the dogs in action pulling a sled down at the village who's going to be handling that for you this morning well jesse royer is going to be joining you down there we've got eight of our dogs down at at the village many of them are our retired iditarod champions and then we also have a lot of young yearlings that are just learning to roam. And all of them will be just demonstrating a little bit about dog running. Well, we'll look forward to that downriver. And uh, by the way, we'll talk more about Jesse Royer a little bit later, a champion of the Race to the Sky in Montana across the international or the Continental Divide. And uh, more about Jesse when we get down on the Tanana River. Right now, we want to say thank you very much to uh, a new mother, by the way, and champion of the Iditarod, Susan Butcher. We do appreciate you coming out, and we'll see Jesse downriver at the village. Take a look over here, too, at the little cabin behind the uh, dogs and everything here on the left-hand side. That's where Susan Butcher and her husband lived for many years. They have a little daughter who's five now, Tecla, and they also have this uh, brand new baby. Well, they built this bigger building here on the shore, and we thought, well, surely that's going to be the new house. No, that is the dog park. Uh, but let me show you their new home. If you look right over top of the dog walker and back in the woods, you'll see a real pretty house they moved into last August. And that is the Munson Butcher home now. Now, you will see the dogs in action downriver, so do look forward to our visit at the Chena Indian Village. And just walk the 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 Now, they are still setting their winter coats. You can see some of them just a little bit ragged instead of shaggy. They are getting rid of that winter hair. They are the animals and the veterinary and nutritional care. They do shed their animals every year. The females after the birth of the young, that little youngster there is probably 12 or 13 weeks old. So the female started growing her animals only after the birth of that little guy. The males shed their animals in the late fall or early winter and then start growing new ones in the late winter. It's a river. That's the source of power for the fish wheel. The basket scoops the salmon out of the water as they're swimming upstream. And of course, they can't see in this silty water, so it makes it very handy for the fish wheel use because the salmon don't know what's coming next. This is operated under an educational permit with the state of Alaska, so we don't have a... Paddle wheel with little paddles on the Yeah. Very comfortable to spend the summer in those. These things come up really nice sometimes because it got chilly at night. We can build a fire in a log tent. But it's really exciting for the whole family to be able to spend all summer outside, especially after being inside most of the winter. And our snow cups is much like this little one back here, but bigger. Other than that, our camp on the Yukon River, very similar to this camp on the Tanana today. Well, Dixie, you mentioned a lot of family and many generations out there. This family has been up in survival techniques and so forth in the culture. Well, I think this is an excellent time for the whole family to learn many different kinds of skills. But being all my sisters, after all the chores were done around campus, we put up in this house. We were around campus, hide, hide. We also learned how to do beadwork, work, work behind school work, and lots of kids going to winter clothing, and all these skills. That, that, that'll be a good uh, time for the family to learn how to do that. Well, it's going to be
Now that is the beginning of the process only. That is uh, the dog food stuff. Well, normally when we're catching a lot of salmon, we don't like to put a wet salmon like that directly into the smoke barrel. So we use the air dryer like this. So the air is just to make it a nice patchy texture a couple minutes or so. The most we can run through the smoke house so we can all the rabbits and we'll have some very dehydrated. Whoa, how about that? Hey, parallel parking, Alaska South. A little bit about how we live. Trey and work together. So I'm going to start off introducing my teammates here. First off is my lead dog. This is Color. This is Bailey. And they have a pretty important job because you know, we have no reins or lines or anything to guide the dogs with. So it's all done with verbal commands. If I want to go right, I say G. If I want to go left, I say Ha. Now back here are my swim dogs. This is Salatna and Sky. Now, they help my leaders get the team started as we're going on the trail. We're also capable of leading, so if I want to give my leader colors a break, I can just switch these guys around. Now, back here are my team dogs. This is Abigail and Yap. Now, if I want to add more power to my team or more dogs to my team, I would do that by adding more team dogs. I would lengthen my gang line out here to accommodate the extra dogs. So, say if I had a 20 dog team, well, I'd put my leaders about 100 feet out in front of my sled. So you can see how important it is for those leaders to always be listening to my verbal commands. Now back here are my wheel dogs. This is Kita and Nike. Now often the wheel dogs are some of the stronger dogs in the team, but the first to feel the way of the sled when you're going up a hill. You can also have to be pretty agile to help move the sled around trees and corners and things like that. Which brings us back here to my job. It has to help me to guide the dogs who are going on the trail, but also to keep this sled upright. And how I do that by shifting my weight from side to side. Sometimes I get up and help the dogs by running or paddling or kicking with my feet. <laughs> well, you can see my teammates. They're getting pretty tired to get going. They're telling me this is my cue to quit talking and let's get back to running. So we're going to go ahead and take off. And before I do, welcome again to Tina Village. And thank you very much, Jesse. Now, folks, watch these dogs take off. When she gets that snow hook up, they'll know it's time to go. And they get real quiet and they just like to pull. You see Jesse working hard back there? It's not a free ride, but watch over here. It's a neat one. She can come on right next to the garden to get straight for the boat. Excellent photographic opportunity. A little smoke curling out of the chimney, the trading post, the flag. Sliding around the bend, dancing off the runners, pushing hard, helping the dogs down the trail. It's a team effort all the way. And now watch back here. If you're outside, you might hear a right turn command. Right turn command is G. G, they went right in the kennel. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jesse Royer, Sue's Butcher's Dogs. Well, folks, I'd like to invite you down here, and he's very comfortable on shore. You back to work. Right now I'm attending the University of Alaska Fairbanks, so I'm working on my master's in teaching. But enough about me. Right now we're in the Tanana Valley, and this is the heart of Athabascan Indian country. And today we'll be sharing with you their culture. We'll show you how they skillfully survived in this environment for over 10,000 years and how they adapted to village life and Western civilization in just the past century. On our tour, we'll have a total of four stops, and we strongly ask that you stay together with us as a group. We have a lot of things we'd like to share with you, and also there are three other groups rotating throughout the village. At the very end of our tour, you'll then have about 10 to 15 minutes to roam around the village on your own, ask questions, and to take any pictures that you might have missed along the way. But uh, we also, at each stop, we ask that you please do not stand on the benches. Some of them are a little wobbly. But right now, I would like to turn over to my friend and fellow guide and fill in. to the Chena Indian Village. My name is Kelly, and I'll be your other guide today. Uh, just to let you know a little bit about myself, I am Athabascan Indian and Yupik Eskimo. I also have a Yupik name. Being the youngest in my family, I was given the name Atanak which means the boss. <laughs> but I'm from the village of Ninana, which is about 50 miles down the Tanana River, which we just came up. 
and I graduated last June from Stanford University with a degree in sociology, and I hope to attend medical school someday. But enough about me. Uh, if you look around us here at our first stop, at this stop we'd like to give you an idea of how the Athabascans survived for thousands of years prior to any contact with Westerners. Now the anthropologists tell us that the northern Athabascan Indians had to survive in one of the harshest environmental conditions known to man and did so for over 10,000 years. Now prior to contact with the Westerners, the Athabascans were nomadic and constantly on the move in search of the wild game. And the primary animals that they hunted were the moose and the caribou. However, they did prefer to hunt the caribou because they're a little smaller than the moose and also they travel in herds. So this made them easier to hunt with their bone and stone weapons. To give you an idea of how they traditionally hunted the caribou, if you look in the middle of the pen, you'll see that tall wooden structure. That's what we call a single pole cache. Now the hunters would set one of these up along the annual migratory trails of the caribou. They could climb up there and spot the oncoming herds. Also, if they had too much meat to bring back to camp all at one time, they could temporarily store some of it up there away from the animals. Now once a herd had been spotted, the hunters would... And this would act as a razor. Now the result of all that work is this here. This is rawhide. And rawhide is very durable and it's very useful, especially when it's cut into strips. And these are the strips. This is basically an all-purpose rope. It's called babbage. And this is the same material that was used at trapping. So in this particular jacket, you'll notice the symbolic patterns of the lynx print, the wolf print, the three toes of the rabbit, and the small white ones connecting them are ptarmigan dancing on the snow. This piece is also trimmed with beaver fur and dentalium shells, and the buttons are made from moose antler. Doesn't Dixie do beautiful work? Yeah. <laughs> now this next garment that the beautiful Olga is modeling for us is a traditional Athabascan Yukon style parka. All traditional except for that big zipper up the front, of course. <laughs> uh, traditionally, this would be a pullover parka that the woman wriggled into, and also it would have a fur lining facing the body. Now, the main body of the parka is made from muskrat. It's trimmed around the cuffs and the bottom with river otter, and the black and white diamonds you'll see are calf skin. Now, the tassels hanging throughout the parka are strips of wolverine tipped with wolf fur. And wolverine tassels were put on the parka because the wolverine is very hard to catch and only the luckiest or most skilled trappers bring one home. So this is sort of a way for the woman to show off that her husband is a good provider and did bring home that tricky wolverine. Now you're going to want to get your cameras ready because she's going to show you the sunshine, huh? <laughs> Anybody want to rub noses with Olga? <laughs> now that outer... <laughs> Started. Again, my name is Jesse and I work at Trailbreaker Kettles. 
We also have a pretty good sized kennel, so I got some of my own. So often people come here, well, they have a lot of questions. Some of the more common ones are, well, just what kind of dogs are these? These dogs don't look much like sled dogs. <laughs> They're awfully small. I expected to see a much bigger dog. So just what breed is this? Well, I'm pretty big of a sled dog. You're probably thinking more of the Siberians than the Malamutes. They're a lot larger dogs, especially the Malamutes, which is well over 100 pounds. But, you know, Siberians, they are used as sled dogs, but Malamutes are not generally used quite as often. They're a lot larger, quite a bit slower dogs. They're sometimes used for weight poles or maybe the occasional recreational team. But, you know, comparing a Malamute to these dogs here, well, it's kind of like comparing the difference between a draft horse and a racehorse. Or maybe, picture in your mind the difference between a weightlifter and a marathon runner. These dogs here are much more akin to the marathon runner than anything else. In fact, that is what they were bred for. They were bred for their endurance, their ability to travel long distances. They were used to haul mail, food, supplies, things like that from village to village. You know, it really is more about running than it is about pulling large amounts of weight. So we don't have the really big, heavy, muscular dogs that everyone's expecting to see because we're not pulling big heavy loads. It is more about running. Now, all the dogs in this pen, every single one of them, is an Alaskan Husky. But the Alaskan Husky, well, it's not a registered or purebred dog. Therefore, we have a variety of different looking dogs because, well, frankly, we just don't care what these dogs look like when we breed them. <laughs> but we don't care if they have blue eyes or brown eyes or very tail with floppy ears. Color makes absolutely no difference. What we're looking for is things like Speed, endurance, strength, intelligence, instinct, curiosity, compatibility, things like that. We're looking for what these dogs can do, not for how they look. And you know, the natives in Alaska, they've had dog teams for thousands of years. But having a team of dogs can make life a lot easier for them, travel a lot faster, and the dogs can also take them a lot farther distances than they could ever travel on foot. So they rewarded the dogs for their hard work by giving them much more consistent care and a much better diet. You know, we see the benefits of these awards even today. The dogs have a lot, <coughs> excuse me, they live a lot longer, healthier lives. Well, in this pen, they range from the youngest one in here, who's Kita right here, she's two years old, to the oldest one in here, and this gray dog over here, that's Color, she's 11 years old. They can even live to be up to 17 and 18 quite commonly. So they're very healthy dogs. Now, being in Alaska, they've had to learn to adapt to their environment. You can get down to 60 blow times in the winter, even up to 100 above in the summertime. So they have to learn to deal with both heat and cold. Now they do that by having two different layers of hair coat. What we see on the outside here, that's a longer coarse guard hair. It's used to protect the dogs from wind and abrasion. But underneath of that guard hair is some really soft under downy coat. It's made up of tens of thousands of microscopic hairs. The dogs are growing each fall before winter. And shed out every spring before summer. Now here's actually a little sample of some of the inner coat that we brush on all these dogs. Just a small fraction, actually, out of one dog. But um, it's very thick, it's very dense. In fact, well, it's so warm that often the muck of the collector's hair, card it, spin it in the yard, and it's sweaters that are very, very warm. There's just only one drawback to these sweaters, though. If you wear them outside, you start training, you come back indoors, well, you're going to smell like a wet dog. <laughs> So these dogs have very good hair coats. In fact, well, they're much more comfortable in temperatures below zero than they ever would be in 80 or 90 above. They like the colder weather, they can't get bred for it for hundreds of years. But even so, say we're out on the trail and we encounter a winter storm or high wind, things like that, we like to give them a lot of protection. So we do that by putting on dog jackets. Now this one that I have here, well, it's just a windstopper. We do have some that are lined with polar fleece from the lion warm. Now, I'm again. Probably got her to help me out. She still has her harness on. So if I was out on the trail, well, all I'd have to do is just slip this right over her head with a Velcro tab that goes underneath her belly here and fastens on the other side. Now, the tug on Abigail's harness, it still sticks out the back. So she can still be proud of leading our team through that winter storm wearing this bright red dog jacket. Thank you, Abby. She thinks she's got a career as a model. <laughs> You know, these dogs, they also travel hundreds of miles in the wintertime. Sometimes, well, they travel up to three or 4,000 miles in one winter. So they have to have very tough feet. But you know, certain snow conditions, well, they can be more abrasive to their feet than others. Like, say, soft, sticky snow, they can make good snowballs out of, we don't want to pack it between their toes, or hard, crystally, icy snow. Well, to protect their feet from the abrasions of the snow, 
point is ever putting on dog booty. Now if I had a 20 dog team, I'd have to pull out 80 of these booties here and put on my team. That might take me a little while to put them all on. Especially if there's 40 below out and heavy gloves on. So I'll just put out one for you to show you how it works. We'll see if we can get Nike here to help us out. Hey Nike! Now, all I have to do is I just slip this right over his foot here. There's a Velcro tab that goes around and fastens to hold it in place. And he's all ready for the races. He's wearing his bright red Nike. <laughs> you know, the dogs, they rely on us quite a bit for their care and nutrition and kind, so that we train them, but well, we rely on them too for their instincts and their abilities to travel in the wintertime. Like just this winter, I was in a race in the lower Kenai Peninsula. It was a couple hundred miles long, and we'd never been in that area before. Now, during the middle of this race, a pretty severe winter storm came along. Lots of high winds, heavy snow, low visibility. It was in the middle of the night, and at times, I'd have to help my leaders break trail for three or four foot drifts. But at other times, because of all the new snow and the high winds and the drifting, well, I had no idea where the trail was. I couldn't tell where it was at. So I'd rely on my leaders' instincts, so and feel to help keep us on the trail. So we had to work together as a team to get to the finish line. There's a trust and retrust the relationship we have with these dogs. We rely on them just as much as they rely on us. Now, I believe I have a few minutes left for questions before we move on to our next stop. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Do the dogs stay here the winter time? The dogs that are here only are here because of the riverboat. So if, when the riverboat does not run, all of these dogs go back to the kennel. In fact, several of these dogs are, um, especially the two big red ones, and they're still on racing teams, um, will be on competitive racing teams this winter. You're probably, um, both of those red ones will be in the Iditarod next year. So, they're only down here just in the summer months when the riverboat is, is running. Now, I am out of time. You guys are waiting over here to take you to your next stop. So if you have any more questions after your last stop, please come back, and I'd be more than happy to answer them for you. Thank you. There's gold in them hills. <laughs> All right. When I'm done or almost done, when I'm done or almost done, you want to go get your poke sack. Your poke sack has your gold bearing gravel in it. You get your poke sack from the poke shack. Hey, Connor. There we go. You get it from Connor. So we try to rhyme as much as we can here at the Gold Ranch. So when you get your poke sack from the poke shack, on the right-hand side of the door there, there is a green crate. And they have all the gold retaining devices. <laughs> There's Ed and Joy, and Dad's going to pan for gold. Pan handles. Oh, I like on the chunk already. Yeah, that's what it was. 1.3 billion. How's it going to go? Two big chunks. We're going to retire now, right? <laughs> Joy has a ring in her nose today. <laughs> Give me that damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> Once you wear it for a while, see how many people notice. <laughs> yeah. You might have to wear it for a while, you can't get it out. <laughs> Do I quit picking your nose? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have a mark there. <laughs> Hello, Eddie. Hey. Going back to the bus. Alaska Pipeline. We're up in Fairbanks. This runs all the way down to Valdez.
in my way. That was the town in Northern Exposure. Oh. Maybe I'll go straight across it. Okay, we're getting on an adventure here. Woo! I've never been over here. I don't know if I'm gonna get kicked out or what. But yeah, he's in my way, so. So it is the town on Sicily, Alaska. I thought I'd show, or on um, Northern Exposure, I thought I'd show you these Tundra tires closer. That's what it was. Um, so you look at those Tundra tires. Those, that land train is the largest land train in the world. And that is what brought the pipeline up on its back. Tires have to be big enough to sink and still roll. So that's why they are so large. Thought I'd show the other side of the coach, the tires. So where are we really? All the signs say something different. <laughs> My winter sunglasses. Ain't no sunshine, you don't need to tip. So he's not destroying them little puppies, eh? Mm -hmm. So then there's so there's a big explosion of small but bears. Mm. Yeah, you know when you play with them. Ah. 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 